So we have left Egypt, anti-kingdom as we have called it. We have crossed the Red Sea and we have looked back to see the, the corpses of our captors floating, destroyed by the power of God. When I think of the Red Sea and the Israelites there on that shore, I, I like to think of or imagine Christians as they stand at the pool of baptism, looking back into their past, seeing the smoldering remains of that from which they have been delivered by the power of God. It, it must be like that. Our turn from sin, our, our, our cleansing in the blood of Christ, the, the beginning of the uh, our, our renewal by the Spirit of God, it must be as drastic as, as looking back and seeing what was and what can never be again. It must be a, a looking back and seeing the pain and the, the ugliness, the, 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 the death, the, the vileness of what was. It must not be, as we stand there at the pool of, of baptism, it must not be a looking back at what was in a desiring kind of way, a, a fare thee well to the old life. We must be filled with thanksgiving for the rescue and the redemption that we, by which we are, with which we have been graced. We passionately turn from that scene of, of, of death and, and, and ruin, and, and we run passionately, just as passionately, into the arms of our Redeemer. Just as you would run from the boogeyman, so to speak, we run to our God because the boogeyman is death and destruction, and that's all he can promise you. That's all that he can give us. And as we stand at the pool of baptism looking back, that's what we see, and we run toward him. Well, that's the way I imagine it. That's the way I think it should be. But it's not always that way. It's not as easy as that. You see, we have spent our whole lives, depending on how old you are, we have spent our whole lives being blindly developed by Satan and by his anti-kingdom. And in that time, we have become like him and, and less like God. So it's going to take time. It's going to take effort for our hearts to be retrained, for our hearts to be regenerated, for our hearts to be transformed, renewed. It's a process in which we must be willing participants, but it is God. Don't forget, it is God who is destroying that past. It is God who will change us from what we were. It is God who will cause us to yearn for the pure milk of the word that we may grow thereby, if we have indeed tasted that the Lord is gracious. But in fact, we see that's not the way it was at the Red Sea. In Exodus chapter 15, you can turn there if you like, we read the wonderful song of, of Moses and Miriam. Listen to him. He's leading the congregation in singing. Let's put it in the, uh, what, second person? I, you, they, we, first person plural. <laughs> We will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is our strength. The Lord is our song, and he has become our salvation. He is our God, and we will praise him, my fathers, our Father's God, and we will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Jehovah is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his armors he has cast into the sea. In his armor he has caught cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also drowned in the sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Jehovah, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Jehovah, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood up like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall be destroyed. But you blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, 
O Jehovah, among the gods. Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in, in praises, doing wonders? The song concludes in verse 17, saying, You will bring them in, speaking of the children of Israel, you will bring us in. You will plant us in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, your own living place, your sanctuary, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord, Jehovah, shall reign forever and ever. What a wonderful song. What a powerful song. What a demonstration of faith song. But the words are hardly out of their mouths before they begin to complain or murmur. In verse 22 of the same chapter, just what, four verses later. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name is called Marah. And the people complained. Look that word up. It means to be obstinate. In, uh, it means actually to, to stop, to obstinately stop. I'm not going any further. But in the verb sense uh, that, that's used here, it, they, they were obstinate against Moses. What shall we drink? So he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast into the waters, the waters, waters became sweet or made sweet. And he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them. He said, this is God speaking to them. He said, if you diligently heed the voice of Jehovah your God and do what is right in his sight, if you will give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of the diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where the twelve... Well, there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. So we walk with God now for three months in the desert. It's a time of training. It's a time of testing. It's a time of, of growing. And unfortunately, it's also a time of much obstinance, a much complaining, much lack of trust. But God shows himself faithful. God shows himself to be the long-suffering God that he is, even in the face of their obstinance, the face of their unbelief. You see, God knows that not only must the old way be destroyed, but a new way must be shown. And the old way being destroyed, we're humans. We don't just, boop, all of a sudden it's, it's cut off and we don't have any memory of the past. We, we have memory of the past, good and, and bad. And so he must put us through a process that helps us destroy that and put us through a process which helps us to see a, a new way. So he provides us water, making bitter water sweet, bringing water from a rock. He provides for us food, bread from heaven and, and quail in the evening. He provides for us shelter from the sun, the, the cloud by day and the fire by, by night guidance he gives us. He gives us something that we have not known for years, for centuries maybe. He gives us a, a day off, a day of rest. He teaches us how to take time off. He wants us to become human again because we have been treated so inhumanely. When Amalek came to fight us in Rephidim, he gave us protection in, in war. He became uh, Jehovah Nisi to us. He became our banner. He became the, the one that we held up. This is our God. He is our Savior. And then we come to Sinai. It's here at Sinai that God speaks. He's been speaking all along, but now he's going to speak directly to us. Moses tells the people at Sinai, he says, you prepare yourselves. You go wash yourself. You go make it. You sanctify yourselves because we're going to go outside the camp and we're going to meet with God. Now, this is a new experience for these people. They have never met with 
God. They've only seen stone and clay uh, idols or carvings or, or whatever. They've never actually met with God. God has never come down uh, to them as far as in, in their their experience. They've always had the experience of dealing with pagan priests. Now think about this. See this through the eyes of people who had been in the land of pagans for some 400 years. Whether or not they were worshiping those gods for those 400 years is immaterial. They did, I think, worship those gods at least a period of that time, maybe not the whole 400 years. But they've been in the land inundated with these stone gods, with these superstitions, with merciless cruelty. This is about more than a group of wilderness wanderers gathering for a a message, you will hear what I'm saying from heaven. This is about all of us. It's about humanity that has been estranged from its maker. It's about the distance that has become between the divine and the human. It's about the, the, the deep gap in the soul of humanity. Sinai is where uh, is an answer to, to, to God's question to Adam. Where are you? At Sinai, God says, I know where you are. I know why you're there. I have not forgotten. I have come to bring you deliverance. I have come to bring you covenant. You see, Sinai is about the reversal of what took place at Eden in Eden, the Garden of Eden. It's a reversal of those consequences. You, because of your sin, brought death to yourself. I told you this would happen, but now I've come to make covenant with you. I come to bring us back to, to, together to give you life. Outside of the covenant is death. In the covenant, there is life. Before God speaks directly to the people, God tells Moses, Moses, remind them what they have just seen. Remind them of what just happened. Remind them of the Exodus. You, verse chapter 19, verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. You yourselves have seen how I carried you out on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. They need to see God's personal pronouns there. This is not what you did. This is not something that you conquered Egypt. This is not something that you did to bring your, this is what I did for you. You didn't do it. You couldn't have done it. This is not what you deserve. This is a gift that I am giving to you despite what you have earned. Rescue. Redemption. Liberation. It, it's all from God. It's received from the hand of God. If we don't understand that we have been rescued, if we don't understand the cost of redemption and who paid it, if we don't see the liberation that we have been graced with, given, that came from the hand of a grace-filled, merciful God, and not by our own works, and we begin to think too much of ourselves. We begin to attempt to take possession of God's kingdom rather than serve him with due appreciation. That's what Jesus accused the, Jew, accused the Jews of. He said that you, you think you will come in and take over God's kingdom because you have earned your right to be here. You are great, upstanding, godly men who have kept the laws. No, that's not how it works. Our freedom in God is a privilege, not a right. It is an act of, a, a, of the grace of God, not what we deserve. We do not come to God demanding. We come to God humbly in thanksgiving. We do not take our freedom for granted. We daily praise him for the salvation that he gave and that he continues to give. We need to understand this before we can grow with God before God can develop us and train us and change us and uh, regenerate us and transform us, we need to understand who's in charge here and what's happening. So God speaks at Sinai, and we need to hear what he said. It's not just for them, it's for us too. I understand we're not under the old law, that we're under a new covenant, but we still need to see what happened in this old covenant because it pertains to us. Listen to it. 
chapter 19, verse 5, he says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, you shall then be a special, a peculiar, a, a guarded treasure to me. You will be the one whom I guard in this world. Notice the if. If you obey me fully, if you keep my covenant, that word covenant is is uh, interesting. It's the uh, same Hebrew word from which we get uh, Testament, you know, like Old Testament and New Testament. This is the same word. In the Hebrew, it carries the idea of cutting a deal. And when they say cutting a deal, they literally mean cutting a deal. It comes from the ancient practice of uh, in, in business and legal and even marriage agreements that in, in those ceremonies, the, in order to seal the deal, they would cut an animal in half and then they would walk, the two covenanting parties would walk between the two halves. And I, to my understanding, the idea is if you break the covenant, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be cut in half or at least something that drastic. So God is inviting these people to make with him a holy covenant, a marriage. Redemption, you see, is not just about being saved. It's about the divine and the human coming together. You were separated because of sin, your sin. After he told you, if you eat of the tree, you will surely die. You believed the lie, and you chose to do what God said do not do and therefore became separated from the God of life, and therefore you're dead. But now the, the divine and the human are coming together in a, in a wedding ceremony, in a covenant. And God says, although the whole earth is mine, you, those of you who come to me, you will be a kingdom of priests. You will be to me a, a holy nation. What's happening here? <laughs> Is God rewarding them or using them or both? You will be for me a kingdom of priests. Now think about what a priest is. Now don't, don't think about uh, the Catholic guy with a little white spot on his throat. Think about a, a priest as they would have understood the term priest. What do priests do? The priest with whom they were associated in Egypt, what do priests do? What is his what are their purposes, or what is their purpose? What is it God is saying to them here? A priest is a person who mediates for the divine. In other words, he, he comes between the people and the God that he represents, whether it's a pagan priest or the priest of God. The, the priest is the one who comes and represents that deity, whatever it is, to the people. A priest is someone who is to show the worshipers the people, what his God is like. So when you go into a temple or a shrine and you see a priest there, take it a Hindu priest or something of that nature, it's about the best that we can associate it with today in our culture anyway. Maybe even a Catholic priest, I don't know. When you go there to their temple, to their shrine, and you see the priest there, what you see them do what you hear them say, when you watch the rituals they perform, you should get a sense of the things about which their God cares. So when God invites these people, if you obey me fully, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, not to me, to him as well, I think, but he, the word here is you will be for me a kingdom of priests. It's an invitation to them to be the ones who will show the world who I am. You will be the ones who will show the world what it is about which I care. We can see hints of this back earlier in the book of Exodus in chapter 7, even before they left Egypt. Moses was sent by God to confront uh, Pharaoh and command Pharaoh, let my people go. In Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1, the text says, Moses, the Lord said to Moses, Moses, see, I have made you, listen to what he says, I have made you like God to the Pharaoh. Like God. I've made you like God. What does that mean? He gave Moses supernatural powers and he can divide the Red Sea. He gave Moses supernatural powers that he can be omniscient and omnipotent. No, that's not what he's saying. The idea is, I have made you to be God's representative before Pharaoh.
And this is God's idea, not Moses's. You will be my priest, Moses. You will be my representative. You'll be the one who shows favor of what's important to me. What's the big idea here? What's God trying to accomplish? I think the answer leads us to a universal truth that is a repeated biblical em uh, emphasis, both in Old and New Testament. And for lack of better words to say it, I'll just say it like this. God needs a body in which to dwell. See, God is a spirit. In order for the world to know who God is, to see God, so to speak, he needs a body, flesh and blood, in which to dwell. God needs bones and, and skin. God wants Pharaoh and all the rest of humanity to know just who is this God with which he is dealing. God wants uh, to, to know, the world to know how God acts in this world. So God chooses to use a, a body. Let's think about this. When you read the Old Testament, when God comes into the world, what happens? Well, think about Mount Sinai. Mountains begin to explode into fire, and there are great sounds of deaf, deafening trumpets and thunder and lightning, and people are scared and go into hiding and say, Moses, you go talk to us. We are too afraid. You might recall in Isaiah chapter 6 when uh, Isaiah saw a vision of God. It's just a vision. And yet Moses was afraid unto death, literally. Well, not that he didn't die, but he was afraid. He says, I am done, undone. I am destroyed. I'm like a dead man. And he was afraid to be in the presence of God. But God is kind. God is a God of compassion. God is a God of love. A God who wants to liberate people from oppression. So God uses a, a body, a, a representative, so that the world will not fear him, but will see him as approachable. God invites them, but let's make it personal. God invites us to be his representatives. He comes into our bodies, the New Testament says, and he lives in us, dwells within us. We are his temple. We are his tabernacle. We are his clay pot in, the, 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 in which he lives. We are the vessel in which he, he lives. And we are to live before the world so that they will see not our clay pots, but the glorious beauty of Jesus Christ, the glorious beauty of God. God lives in us. It is not I who lives anymore, Paul says, but Christ lives in me. I am to demonstrate who God is to the world. That's what we mean by priest. That's what God is inviting them to be when he says, I will, if you will obey my voice, if you will do this, then I, you will be for me in the world a kingdom of priests. Not only that, he says, you will be for me a, a holy nation. And again, we need to pay attention to what God is doing. In Genesis, we, we saw the progression of sin, remember? We saw the violence and the death that came as a result of eating the fruit that was forbidden. We started with the, the fruit. We went to, one, to the next generation where one of the children, one of the sons, kills another son out of jealousy. And we saw how quickly that led into an entire civilization of opposition to God, of violence and the imaginations and the thoughts and the hearts of, of, the, of all humanity was evil continually. Exodus begins with the Israelites enslaved by a nation immersed in sin and violence and oppression and, and death. We called it anti-kingdom. Egypt is the anti-kingdom. And I want you to keep that phrase in your mind. When you think Egypt, I want you to immediately think anti-kingdom. We'll see it later, uh, how important that is. But Egypt, or anti-kingdom, represents that head of steam that we talked about, which always gains a head of steam that's being produced or, or, or being gained in, in uh, institutions and cultures and structures where sin is allowed to go unchecked. If you don't 
stop it. If you don't do something that it, it begins to build up and build up and build up and it begins to do what steam does if when it's un unchecked and uncontrolled. This is anti-kingdom. Anti-kingdom is a place where dehumanization takes place, where people are treated less than human, like in Egypt. These slaves, they understand that to a degree. They felt it. They've experienced. They've come from being slaves, and now they stand at Sinai. And God says, I want to invite you to be my nation, a different kind of nation. That's what the word holy really, really means, different, set apart for a sacred purpose, sanctified. You're going to be a different kind of nation, a holy nation, a nation that's not shaped by greed, a nation that's not shaped by violence, a nation that's not shaped by abusive power. God wants to form a nation of people that is shaped by compassion and, and justice and care for one's neighbor. So God is saying, you, you've experienced Egypt. You know what that's like. You've be, been dehumanized by them because of their violence and the, their following that way. I want to show you a new way, a way of shalom, a way of peace, not the way of chaos. You had that. Now let's do shalom kingdom of shalom, kingdom of peace. God is calling us to be anti-Egypt or calling them, and I think us, to be anti-Egypt. They are anti-kingdom. We're going to be anti-anti-kingdom, if that makes any sense. Guys, as, as Christians, we need to see ourselves in, in this picture. And I, I don't want to take away from the fact that that is a, a story for them, but God hasn't left us out of this story. This story is here for a reason for us 2,000 years later, 4,000 years later. As God called them and led them out of anti-kingdom, anti Egypt, God has called us by the gospel, by the message of Jesus Christ, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through this process, I am calling you out of the world, out of anti-kingdom, not just to be saved from that, but to be different from that. You are to be a holy nation, Peter says, a different kind of nation. We're not supposed to be like them anymore. That's why I say when we stand at the pools of uh, the pool of baptism and we look back, we're looking back at something that's awful, horrible, terrible, that from which we want to run away. It's not something desirable. Oh, I can't, I'm so sorry that I'm going to lose out on all the fun. No. We're painting the wrong picture when we tell young, young people that, uh, well, you're going to become a Christian. It's going to be really hard because you're going, to, you're going to have to give up all the things that are fun. Fun is, is drunkenness. You can see what drunkenness leads to. Fun is death. I mean, when you teach uh, a world of people that has been, a culture of people that has been taught, like, like has been taught in our country, that you came from apes, you came from nothing, you came from an accident in, in nature billions of years ago. And therefore, because we're all, along with the alligators and, and uh, ostriches and giraffes and whatever is out there, we're all just freaks of nature, freaks of a, an accident of, of nature. And therefore, no life is any more sacred than the other. And we, with our thinking processes, think, well, if no life is sacred, then I can do what I want to whomever I want to achieve what I want. And so we, we kill people. We kill innocent babies in the womb because they're in our way. Oh, whoops, got pregnant. So that's not going to go well with my career, so cut the baby out. Someone gets in your way and you, you need to step on their neck to get to the next level. Step on their neck. It's how we live. It's our culture. It's because we believe the lie. God is calling us out of that, out of anti-kingdom, to be a different kind of people, a different kind of nation, while still living here. That's the message of First Peter. While you still live here, be a pilgrim, be a stranger, be a sojourner, but don't be like them. That's going to cause trouble. 
And God tells us that in the book of 1 Peter. If you are not like them, they're going to see that you're not like them. Some of them will abuse you because of it. Some of them will say evil things about you. They will uh, accuse you of, of things that aren't true. But you continue to be my people, different from them. And some of them will see. Some husbands will be turned, even without a word from the wife, just by their actions. Some of those who are masters, abusive masters over slaves, by the slave's fateful conduct, but if the slave will continue to do what Peter says do in that text, they will turn the eyes or the hearts and the souls of some of those masters. And it happened. Slavery went away for the most part. It doesn't exist today. Why? Because Christian slaves of that time began to do, those who trusted, began to do what God said do. And it changed the world. Without, going, without the slave going to the master and say, I have my rights. I'm a human just like you are. You can't treat me that way. That's true. They should not uh, treat them that way. That person is as human as the uh, master is. But if the slave will simply live honorably before not only the master, but in the world, live as a child of God, as the holy nation of God, he will change that master's thinking by his action. That's the promise of Peter. It won't happen all the time. There are some who are rebellious and they don't want to be changed. They want to continue to be whatever they are. And they're not looking for being changed, but there are some who are human, or at least they want to be human. And they'll see in your conduct that rehumanization We're not supposed to be like them. We need to see, gain the perspective that God is trying to give us in his world and his word, that we are different than that. We must be different from that. That's anti-kingdom. We are called to be kingdom of God. And that's what he calls us, why he calls us to make us holy, to make us different. Well, up until now, God has been speaking to the people through Moses for the most part. But a point comes when he speaks directly to the people. And that's what we see in Exodus chapter 20. Beginning with these words, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, who brought you out of the land of slavery. Do you see what's happening here? To understand the covenant relationship between God and the people, we need to understand that what God and the people have been through together. Their relationship is rooted in the act of deliverance that God has performed on their behalf. So don't ignore the implications here and don't ignore the implications for us today. Our relationship with God as a Christian is rooted in an act of deliverance that he has performed on our behalf. This is not some abstract God who floats above the uh, dirt and pain of, uh, of the world. This is a God who is fundamentally, fundamentally defined by his actions or action on behalf of the oppressed. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse 8? God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The key word there is demonstrates. God didn't just say, I love you. God so loved the world. I am love. God demonstrates his love in that while you were sinners, not good, godly, holy, greatest people on earth, while you were sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, God is love. How do I know? Look at what he did. So God says to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. Who? Which Lord? I am the Lord which brought you out. I am the Lord which acted in your behalf. I brought you out of oppression. He's introducing himself to them. He wants them to know what kind of God he is. With this reminder of their liberation still floating in the air, God gives them what we call the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. That's what it's called in Hebrew. These Ten Commandments, these ten words, most people see them as strict rules given by a fire-breathing God in order to keep the uh, people in line. Toe this line. Do what I tell you. I'm the boss. Well, in that sense, then they would be a little different than the commands or laws of Pharaoh. But there's something else going on here in these 
There's something different going on in these commands. When we see them in their original context, these commands take on a different kind. These words, 10 words, take on a different meaning, a different perspective. We need to remember that just three months ago, these people were living as slaves. And as we've discussed before, slavery is an inhumane condition. It's being treated as if you were not human. In fact, if you, the longer you stay in slavery, the more inhumane or unhumane, unhuman you are treated. I mean, we can see that in our own country, the story of, uh, of uh, Roots uh, in, by Alex Haley, I think you can see in that story that there are a lot of people who just accepted that I'm, I'm not human. I think the, the storyline in that uh, thing shows us that there at least was that one person, that one line of people who refused to be, accept that he's less than someone else. But the general population, because of how they're treated consistently for centuries, they become to think of themselves as less than human. That's what slavery does. Slavery is being owned. Slavery is being treated as property. Slavery is being robbed of the dignity and honor of being a human. Slavery is having no more value than a tally of bricks. This mental shaping would deeply affect how the Israelites saw themselves and how they saw the world around them. So God begins here at Sinai with the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, and it's a, a process, a long process, I think, of rehabilitation, of rehumanization. It's a process of teaching them how to be human again. We could and maybe should stop here and talk about the problem of um, human trafficking in our society here in Atlanta, where we live. It's one of the uh, centers for human tracking, probably the greatest center for human tracking because of our human trafficking because of our uh, big airport here. But at any rate, it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing that's taking place in our society. It would be a, a good place to stop and talk about it, but we, we, something greater is being presented to us here. I want you to think about the New Testament, the, the New Covenant. I want you to think about the, the, the spiritual implications here. We have entered into a covenant relationship with God. Those who have become Christians, we have entered into a covenant relationship with God. And in that covenant, in that new covenant, just like in the old covenant, God is teaching us how to be human again. Not human by the world standards, the anti-kingdom standards, but human according to the way things were in the beginning when Adam and Eve walked with God in communion with God there in the garden. God wants that for you. But to have that, we have to go through a transformation. We have to be changed, regenerated, or some of the Bible words, renewed from what we were in the sin. God wants us to be one with him in the church, and we will be that with him in heaven. So he wants to recreate us. That's the purpose of the new covenant, or at least the what's happening in the new covenant. We are being recreated. We are being renewed. We are being transformed. We are being, to use a uh, the word of our thinking, rehumanized. So these these commands are, are vital truths about what it means to live in authentic human community. Whether we're talking about Old Testament commands or New Testament teaching of the way, we are being trained to live in authentic human community. Human as God created us, not human as we have become living in the world. We can't remain the same. That's slavery. That's the slavery from which God is delivering us. We can't remain the same. So look at the commandments given in this covenant, this old covenant. The first commandment instructs the people, have no other gods. Their renewed humanity is directly connected to their ability to remember the 
liberation, the, the gift which they have been given, for, given by whom? By God. If you forget God, if you forget the one true and living God who freed them, who did all that that they saw in the last uh, three months ago, if you forget that, then you're forgetting your story. You're forgetting where you came from, what you were. And if you get, you forget your story, you might forget what it was like to be slaves. Isn't that what happens a lot of times? We stay in Christ. We, we become Christians. We go to church, we go to church, go to church, and we... Because God isn't a, we don't allow God to be a, a, a vital part of our daily life. We forget who he was and what we were. And we become, begin to drift back to what we were. So God reminds them first thing, and maybe this is something that you should do every day you get up. Remember the God who delivered you. The God who saved you. So I think sometimes we we get baptized and we think, well, we, we, we got religion or we got salvation, but we don't really think about the fact that we are being rescued or saved from something horrible. We just got saved. And we don't think about the implications of that word. God has delivered you from something evil or from evil. And the second command begins to build upon that. He, he says, uh, have no image of anything. Don't worship any images of anything. There, put no other gods before me. I am the, the only God. There are no other gods. Have no other gods. And don't make any images of anything to represent me or anyone else. In the ancient Near East, people tried to, or it was their thinking to conceptualize their many gods using images. So you have the paintings and drawings and carvings that we saw in Egypt and the other deities that you'll see later on. They made statues, carvings, idols, uh, physical representations of the divine being uh, that those things that they believe would control their fate or did control their fate. A statue or a carving gives reality to it, gives size and depth to the, their divine. It helped them to understand just who was their God and what kind of God he was. But God says, I'm different than that. I'm not like that. I am the God who redeemed you. Don't forget the God who redeemed you. Don't forget what he's like. And he wasn't like some figure of sticks and stones. I'm inviting you to be my priests. I'm inviting you to be the ones who will be my image. That's how I see this. You're invited to show the world the God of the Exodus through your lives. We think about that. The image of God. We are the priest of God and we are to be presenting his image to the world by the way that we live, not just not doing bad things. You know, that's what we oftentimes think about. Well, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't cuss. That's what God's like. He doesn't smoke, drink, or cuss. It's more than that. Our God doesn't need images of wood or stone or marble or whatever. Our God has a people, a nation, a priest, a, a, a nation of kingdom of priests, people who are uh, reformed, people who are reborn, experienced a new birth, regenerated, renewed. God is looking for a body, and you're it. Now, we're not to be worshipped by the world, but we are to be the thing, not a carved image, image, but we are to be the body that God uses to represent himself to the world. The next command, he says, do not, and this is important because it's, it's, they, they build upon each other. I am the only God. There is no other, but no other God before me. Don't make any carved images. You are my image. You are to be my image. And then the third command, do not take the name of Jehovah your God in vain. Now, the Jews have, uh, over the centuries, 
taken that to mean don't say God's name. They were so afraid of offending God or taking his name in vain that they would not say his name. You can't ask a, a Jew what the name of God is because they won't tell you because they can't say the word. When they print the word, they will often print the first letter and the second letter and just draw a line or maybe not put anything at all and just leave a space there for what the name of God would be because they don't want to be guilty of saying the name of God in vain. And that's not what God is saying here. The word take uh, when it says, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, it <clears throat> is from a Hebrew word that is also or can also be translated carry. Do not carry the name of the Lord your God in vain. And you think about what's going on. God has redeemed these former slaves. He's now inviting them to be representatives of this redemption, to be the one who, or be representative of a God who made it happen. When you go into the world, into Amalek or into Canaan or to Moab or wherever, wherever you go, you carry the name of God. You show people what kind of God he is. Don't carry my name in vain or in a worthless way. God's reputation in the world is going to depend upon how they carry his name. And we'll read later on that God divorces his people because of the way they were carrying his name. They were giving him a bad reputation. He's the God of heaven and earth, the God of love, compassion, and, and grace and mercy. But they were showing the world something different, saying, we are Jehovah's people. And Jehovah's people had become a hiss and a byword, and so he had. Do not carry my name in a vain or worthless, empty way. Sure, we can say this is about, don't say ugly words, put God's name in it, but that's not what he's talking about. This is about how they carry themselves as <clears throat> people who carry the name of God. As you carry my name, how will you treat the poor? You know, it's not just about doing good things or not doing bad things. Don't smoke, drink, or cuss. As you carry my name, how do you treat the poor? Like I do. As you carry my name, how will you treat the oppressed? As you carry my name, how will you treat the, the, the downtrodden, the slaves, the homeless? Do you see how I've treated you? I want you to remember, I'm the God who redeemed you. That's how this text started out. I redeemed you from that. And you need to be, understand that you have been saved, redeemed, purchased, um, rescued, on eagle's wings from something that was devouring you, something that was killing you, something that was destroying you. You weren't rescued from the good life to come and live a pure life. You were rescued from something that was awful and evil. You were oppressed. You were slaves. You see how I treated you? You are now what? My people, you have my name. Don't carry my name in an empty, useless, evil way. You show people that I am the God of the oppressed. I am the God of the, the slave. I am the God of who gives freedom, who cares, who's compassionate. You must be a people who care, who are compassionate because you carry my name. The fourth command <clears throat> is take a Sabbath. Every week, Take a Sabbath. Don't do any work. I don't know if we can understand this because we've not experienced what they experienced. <clears throat> but in Egypt, they worked every day without a break as slaves. They were treated as objects to be exploited rather than people to be cherished. The Sabbath, as Jesus says, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's a command, if you want to call it that, it's command. To show them, I, I love you. Egypt didn't love you. They treated you like animals. But me, I, I want you to take a day off. We're not in Egypt anymore. We, uh, our value doesn't come from the number of bricks that we make. Rather, our significance comes from the God who rescued us, the God who, who loves us. So God says, take a day off. Use that day to honor who I am for the freedom I've given you. Use that day to reflect. If you take a day every day of the week to reflect upon the God who saved you and from what he saved you, you will have great reverence for that God. 
That's what he's asking them. I want you to understand who I am, what I've saved you from, and what I've given you. These Ten Commandments are, again, they're God's way of showing us how to be really human. Not human according to anti-kingdom standards, but human according to God's standard. They show us how to live in a, in a covenant, in a marriage with the God who hears the cry of the oppressed, the God who, who liberates the oppressed. Everything about the rest of these commandments speaks to a newfound liberty, a newfound uh, freedom. And God is inviting. God is, is looking. He's searching for a body, a group of people to be the body of God in this world. And following the Ten Commandments, we're going to see all kinds of laws and commands on how to, to live in this new way that God is training them to be, to, he's called them into. For example, in Exodus chapter 22, it says, if you take a neighbor's cloak as a pledge, verse 26, Exodus 22, verse 26, if you take a neighbor's cloak as a pledge, return it by sunset, because that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can your neighbor sleep in? If you take it and don't give it back to him, when he cries out to me, I will hear his cry, for I am a compassionate God. Now, do you remember what God did when he heard the cry of the Israelites? Those who were oppressing them, those who weren't, so to speak, giving them back their cloak, what did God do? He destroyed them. When he cries out to me, the one you have oppressed, if you don't give your neighbor's cloak back that he gave to you as a pledge, if you don't give it back to him, if you're not compassionate to him, I will hear his cry because that's who I am. I'm compassionate. If you begin to oppress individuals, is the idea here, like Egypt did, I will hear, I will hear, I will act. Don't become another Pharaoh. Get this point. This is going to be important to the next step that we come to in, in uh, next week's lesson. Well, I told you we're going to do some retracking and reviewing. We've done that. We haven't got to Kings yet. We'll get to Kings in the next lesson. We'll get to Solomon. And this is key to understanding what takes place. Don't become another Pharaoh because God acts against people like Pharaoh. God acts against people who promote anti-kingdom. In Exodus 22, verse 21, it says, you shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict a widow, any widow or a fatherless child. If you afflict them anyway, and their cry, they cry out to me at all, I will surely hear their cry. Understand what he means by I will hear their cry. When he heard Israel's cry in Egypt, he came and he rescued, and that rescue meant the destruction of Egypt. And so he says, I will surely hear their cry, verse 24, and my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives and your or will become widows. Your children will become fatherless. I will hear their cry. I will act. In Exodus 23, God warns them about showing partiality, about taking advantage of the poor, about perverting justice. He continually warns them in verse 23. He says, if you do, in chapter 22, verse 23, if you do any of this and they cry out to me, I will hear their cry. Don't forget that. He keeps repeating it, and I think we need to understand it. It's as if God is saying, the thing that I have caused to happen to you, liberation, freedom, Go make it happen for others. Freedom from oppression that you are now experiencing, go help others experience that freedom. The grace that you have been extended, to which you have been called, when you are at your lowest, go and extend it to others. In the same way that I have heard your cry, go and hear the cry of others and accomplish compassion or act compassionately on their behalf. God measures our faith by how we treat widows and orphans and strangers and the weak among us. It's his desire that we will bring exodus to the weak in the same way that God graciously brought exodus to us in our weakness. We have been freed. We were slaves of sin, but we have been freed, cleansed, purified, sanctified, and freed and God now dwells within us. Go and show the world God. God's words to the people through Moses begin with, 
if you fully obey me, chapter 19, verse 5. It's an invitation. It's an opportunity. But don't forget the giant if that's there. If you do this, then you will become my kingdom, a priest, my holy nation. If you obey me, it's not like we deserve it or earn it, but it's only as we show ourselves to be priests of God, the dwelling place of God, the representatives of God. It's only as we show ourselves to be different from the world that we can be those who belong to God. And that raises the question, did they do that? Speaking of those Israelites, were they true to this covenant? You know, they said at the end of the covenant that, you know, you will be our God. We'll be your people. We agree to this. We sign. We'll walk through the animal with you, so to speak. But did they? How did they respond to God's invitation? We started in Egypt. We've come to Sinai. But to answer the if question, we're going to have to go to Jerusalem. And that's where, when we get there, I'm afraid you won't like what you see. So we have looked again at the purpose of the books, you might say, the re revelation, the record that we have been given uh, in from Genesis up through, I think, uh, the time of the kings. And we're going to come to the time of kings next week. And we're going to see, well, in our next lesson, we'll just, uh, I'll just save it there. We'll stop there and we'll come to see what we will see in the time of the kings. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope that this class has been informative to you. It's not maybe what you anticipated in the introduction to the Old Testament, but this is what we're doing. We're trying to see why the Old Testament is here, not just read the words of the Old Testament and get all the meanings of all the stories. You'll do that in some classes that you, in the classes that you'll have in the future, but I'm trying to give us an understanding of why we have this record. This is God's story. It's not the story of Israel. This is God's story, him using Israel, just as in the New Testament or in our lives, we are to be presenting God's story, not ours, but his. Well, again, uh, time is up, I think. Uh, thank you, and, and God bless, and I will see you next week.